Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. We help insurance professionals move from captivity to freedom. Thanks for uh, checking us out on YouTube. For those of you that are seeing this in video and not just in your podcast feed, uh, this by the time you hear this episode or watch it, uh, we have four or five episodes that are uh, now on YouTube. Thank you, technology and innovation. For the longest time, I was just recording audio only because the previous platform that we recorded on for the first 120 something episodes glitched out like nothing else if we tried to record video at the same time. Um, I <laughs> Just a quick little side story. You guys heard the episode with Hank Williams, kind of a big deal, president of Lloyd's North America, big interview. I attempted after working with the team at another vendor, I'm not gonna name drop them because, well, you know, there's no need for that. But the, the interview, broke up in mid conversation and the whole thing crashed, had to restart my computer and apologize profusely to Hank freaking Watkins. So after that, I'm just like, oh man, no, there's not going to be any video anytime soon. But thank you to squadcast.fm, who was recently acquired by Descript, by the way, for those of you that produce content, and I know Agency Focus has content, as we'll get to here in a second with my guest, Colby, and this is the most rambling intro of all time, but... We are now recording on Squadcast.fm, and if you have a Descript membership, you get Squadcast for free. And Squadcast is definitely worth paying for all by itself. Enough of that. Now time for my guest. He is a very smart man because he chose to align himself with the incomparable Kerry Wallace. And uh, Colby, thanks for making time to, to talk with us here today, man. Really appreciate you stopping by. Thank you. And uh, I didn't know it was going to be video. I took my hat off to show my bald head just to make sure that the light is on my face okay. But uh, Oh, no. I'm sorry. Okay. I should have made that clear. You know what? I think it's it's a beautiful bald head. And bald is the new beautiful, right? Thank you. That's, uh, I embrace it. So I, Apparently you do because you took your hat off and you look just fine with your hat on either way. And nice beard, by the way. We're in the beard family for sure. Yeah, those yeah. of us... Uh, yeah, that the have have hair in our chin. There you go. No so. shade. November still has meaning, but when you have a little bit of momentum before then, it's just another month. So it's just a head start, right? There you go. Yeah, awesome. So when when I have the open call for guests, and I do that once or twice a year, just to chum the water and see who's out there that might uh, that I might not already be very aware of. Uh, you reached out on LinkedIn and was like, hey. I listened to your podcast. I think there's some interesting stuff we could talk about. And I'm like, huh, yeah, absolutely we could. So I really appreciate you uh, to raising your hand there, man. It, there, there's some folks out there that are self-promotional that enjoy the sound of their own voice. And they have an agenda when they reach out and say, hey, you know, I'd like to be on your podcast. I typically don't give those people a microphone because it doesn't really work out well. But I know Carrie well enough, and I've seen enough of your content to know that that's definitely not Colby Allen. So um, glad to have you here, man. You know, there are two things that you and I both agree. We we both see as very clear opportunities uh, in this conversation to add to the overall narrative of Agency Freedom Podcast. But we haven't talked about it that much because full transparency, as I talked about in my book, Leaving Captivity, uh, in, in, in Chapter 5, talking about all the financial stuff, I'm still learning a lot of this stuff myself. After being a captive agent for six years, a lot of the things that you are a legitimate expert in, I am certainly not. So it's not until I get someone like you on the pod that we get to talk about these things. Because if I acted like I knew what I was talking about with my audience, a lot of them would be like, hey, wait a second. Why are you talking about this? Because in your book, you talk about how you have a lack of financial literacy uh, going into the whole risk wealth thing. And you know, up until the last two years or so, I really had no business even opening my mouth on it because I didn't really understand it. Thankfully, to you know, to give props to agency CFO and Donna Ropolzinski, uh, they have been my CFO, fractional CFO, for more than two years now. I've, yep. I've learned most of what I know from them, so I'm a little bit dangerous, but you, my friend, are far more dangerous in these areas. So for those out there in listening land trying to decide if you're going to keep listening to this rambly episode or not, uh, the two things that Colby and I are going to talk about after we hear from him and hear his story and backstory and what makes him tick and what his why is and all that good stuff, we're going to go deep into producer compensation and also agency valuation, some M&A stuff. We're going to leave the really heady EBITDA stuff. Carrie is the one who wears the EBITDA hat. 
and literally wears a black hat that says EBITDA on the front of it. It's pretty cool swag. But we're not going to get in any of that. We're going to stay very practical, very actionable. So, um, Colby, if I, if I may, I'd love to hear your backstory. How in the world did you find your way into the crazy world of insurance? So a couple of things to start. Uh, I'll try to make it a challenge. I won't say EBITDA for this entire podcast. And if I do, we'll take Ooh. that as a somebody will have to give me a bet that we'll have to, to make. So, um, also, and thank you. I mean, your context about not really being open to everyone that reaches out uh, is pretty pretty memorable to me. So I appreciate you being open to that. And yeah, um, man. I want to first say thank you again for your show. Um, I have been in the independent kind of consulting space now for six, almost seven months. Part of my background is I work for a regional and then a national broker. And I can tell you that oftentimes the social circles within big broker spaces and then smaller private independent agency spaces, they tend to be different circles. So for me to be able to get out and network and meet people, uh, your shows is actually one of the first things recommended to me to learn about the small independent space. Uh, so I've been a long time listener and it's just an honor to be here talking to you today. But Oh, that's cool, man. I really appreciate you sharing that. I had no idea. Very cool. So you... Uh-huh. What did you do before consulting? It's obviously, you know, I, I'm guessing from the full beard that I see there that you haven't just been in the career in the job world for six or seven months. So what, what did you do, you know, when you're growing up? What did you want to do? Was there a dream that you had in mind? Like, how in the world did you find yourself to be on the career path that led you to us in our industry? Sure. So I'll try to keep it short. Uh, if you look at my resume, I've got too many jobs. But the, uh, the, the gist of it is I grew up, I was the son of an electrician. My dad is an electrical contractor and still is to this day. And uh, he specializes in a couple of different things, such as like cellular tower work and uh, work in convention centers, that type of thing. But I crawled in enough crawl spaces and through enough attics in hot Louisiana to realize I didn't want to hmm. do that the rest of my life. No, 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 no. <laughs> so, uh, you can put that in the list of jobs that I will never do. Six, six is not built for crawl spaces. <laughs> no, no. And I'm no, a five, man. six. So even being that small, it's never fun. But Oh, man. But, uh. I was a non-traditional student for college, actually didn't finish high school, and I got my GED and then went back to school later, but uh, decided I had, from the background from my dad, I wanted to be kind of like in safety. I had a couple of OSHA certifications and oftentimes on the sites was dealing with the safety managers, that type of thing. So I actually wanted to go for safety, uh, fell into the insurance program at my local college with the idea of still being like a safety professional. Uh, Because when I met the director at the program, he said, my career rate for my students is 100% before graduation. So I said, sign me up. Like, I don't think you can tell a college student anything better. Mm. Um, But throughout that process, uh, started learning about insurance in the industry a little bit. Had no family, no experience prior to this. And then my first exposure to the industry was my internship at a regional agency. I double majored or majored and minored uh, insurance risk management and then finance. Mm. Um, So the internship offer that I had was actually for the finance department for a regional agency here in Mm. town and picked it up. And the very first thing that I was doing in my internship was actually production reports and reconciling producer compensation statements. So you could say like my first exposure to the industry was how much money producers are bringing in and how much money we're giving to the producers. Mm. And then throughout that time period, I was with that agency for about five years, Um, worked my way up to a couple of different uh, different positions in reporting and operations and stuck within the finance and operations space for a while. Uh, that agency was sold then to another larger national agency. And from there uh, helped with, sorry, let me back up, back to the M&A space. Um, I was also through that process on the M&A team as we would acquire agencies and bring them into our agency on uh, revenue reconciliations, doing the book of business transfers. So even though I didn't do valuations from that that team, uh, I was very familiar with the the due diligence process and the valuation process. And then after, as some people call it, you know, day two, when you buy an agency, what actually happens after that fact. Uh, So when our agency sold to another larger agency, I was actually uh, one of the key analysts that helps with the book of business transfers to consolidate to the national agency. Um, And then from there, took on an analytics and data project management role to roll out sales platforms for producers and helping understand books of business and upselling opportunities and um, data and analytics from a national agency standpoint is kind of my background. Um, Man, I got to really, you know, exert some self-control and not take the entire interview and go off in that direction and talk about data analytics and crunching numbers on M&A and what the buy box looks like and due diligence and all of that. 
I, I imagine that's probably something we could have an entire episode on. So uh, we may just have you come back a second time and get into that because whew, that's a lot of fun. There's a lot of moving parts there. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of, of depth in that conversation. So hearing that's in your background, that is really cool, uh, especially at the at the regional level, because a lot of small agencies aspire to engage in M and A activity but they don't have a lot of volume in that space. Uh, but a regional agency absolutely does. So imagine you could tell us some really good stories and warn some people where the landmines are with the, ooh, we went through that one time. That was ugly. Don't recommend it. So, sure, man. Well, just okay. like, even to that, like one, one tip I'll throw out real quick and just on that is oftentimes when you read the headlines of, you know, Arthur Gallagher buying an agency or Hub buying an agency, um, it's never usually about the revenue. Like the purchasing is strategic about either uh, teams or an industry. And when yeah. you see that in the headlines, it's, hey, we're making this acquisition for a very specific reason. Yeah. Um, so we say it's not shiny revenue syndrome, but, you know, are you actually making a, a decision for your agency to increase the intrinsic value and find other synergies? Man, I mean, perfect example. And I know this is a, a little bit of me shooting my shot, but one of the things that I'm looking at for our growth is to acquire an agency that is located not in Texas, that has a physical office location somewhere in a non-cat prone state, specifically somebody with a good auto owner's book. Uh, because mm. auto owners is a critical piece of my, I, w I wouldn't say national, but certainly super regional growth plans for the future. And auto owners was like, oh, that's cute. You're domiciled in Texas. We are absolutely not talking to you. Yep. Yep. And in order for us to even have a possibility of that, we have to acquire an agency that has a brick and mortar location and a really good high performing AO book in order for us to have any chance of ever having an AO contract. So that's it to your point, the shiny object syndrome. The object typically isn't money. It's probably something, you know, the talent at the team, a program that they've got or a contract that you want. Right. Is that about exactly. it? That's it. That's a that's a very important key aspect that people don't consider. And uh, and oftentimes, too, when you get into those conversations, people tend to not think about the conversations that you actually should have with those carrier reps. Yeah. Because even though we're independent agents in the space and we partner with certain carriers for distribution, carriers have very intentional distribution strategies themselves. Mm -hmm. And if your agency is not aligned with that, then they may not be open to that same conversation. Yeah. And, uh, Man, I can't tell you the number of, of stories I've heard from people that went through M&A uh, processes with the intention of getting themselves a contract or two, and they didn't run it by the carrier first and come to find out after it was too far down the line that the carrier's like, oh, no, we are not going to allow you to transfer yeah. that code, and uh, we will non-renew all of those policies, and you'll have to find a new home for it. It's like, man, talk about a big, fat whoopsie. And so, you know, I know that's, that's a different conversation we'll have at a different day, most likely. But folks, if you're doing an M&A, make sure you're talking to the carriers before you commit to anything, because it may not work out as you have planned, especially if there's a lot of you know, underwriting or catastrophe or loss ratio concerns. So, Even at the bare minimum, one thing you should look at is your contract with that carrier, because oftentimes there are terms in that contract to notify them of a change in ownership. And so even if it's not just having the cordial conversation with your marketing rep, but there are contractual terms around the change of ownership for an agency that a carrier wants to be aware of because that's something that they need to be aware of. So, yeah. so we, uh, I, got, I drew myself off sides there for a little bit, uh, talking about M&A stuff. But one of the things that you brought up is something that you're really passionate about and you have a lot of experience about is helping agency owners figure out the producer compensation. So um, how, how do you even begin to approach that conversation? Is there, is there some philosophies that you subscribe to or some thoughts you have just in a general sense before we drill down and get into some, some deep data stuff and some real nuts and bolts topics within that area? Sure, sure. And uh, there are, I think, a few things that influence, I guess, my experience in that specific conversation being from a larger agency because once you get to a certain scale, uh, and even for a smaller agency, what is not really looked at closely enough is the biggest item on your P&L is compensation. Yep. And you hear stories when a bigger agency comes and buys a smaller agency, the first thing they look at is often the producer comp plan. And 
really it's understanding the reasons behind that part of it and why they're looking to have that change. Um, but really to, to kind of answer your question, there are a couple methodologies that we use in our services with agencies to look at designing a comp plan or if they want to bring on a new producer or even bring on their first producer. What does that look like? And so if you go into Facebook groups like Soup or IOA, right, all these different public spaces that the question comes up constantly. What do you pay your producers and how do you pay them? Oh, man. And it, it the first it's part It's like of those is, people have never heard of the Big Eyes Best Practices Manual or any of these other resources that are, oh, I don't know, coming from a professional instead of just an anecdote in a public Facebook group. Sorry, I know. Wild idea, right? Talk to a professional <laughs> instead of posting among your peers. When there are, it's to your point, there are some best practices, there are some guidelines, but even then, our approach that we take is we we start with looking at a, a guideline or best practice, but then it really does dive down into the individual agency and what's yeah. available for that producer to be successful and be supported. Because mm -hmm. uh, like just in general, we'll just start, you know, shooting some shots. Uh, you'll often hear 50-50 or 70-30, whatever the different rates are. And any agency owner you talk to say, this plan works for me. There's oftentimes um, they don't see an issue in their P&L currently or long term. But what I'll offer is the main question that should be asked when you talk about producer compensation is what is that producer doing and what is their responsibility? Yeah. Because there should be, again, some guidelines on there should be X amount of dollars allocated to payroll as a whole for the agency. Yeah. And then within that, there are subsections of different categories such as the owners, administration, service, sales. Sales is a part of the compensation. It's not everything. Yeah. And so for an agency, if they have 50 to 55% budgeted for total compensation, but they're paying their producers 50%, does that really give them a lot of margin to haul for service or other things to help maintain and support that book of business? Yeah. And, and, and for me, the, the interesting part to think about in terms of compensation, specifically, and you brought it up there at the end, on the, on the service side of things, is okay. I get it from a sales perspective for sure. Like that yep. part is is easy. You're 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 looked at based on your performance. What's your book of business? You know what's your what's your rolling twelve and so on. And, and then that's that's pretty simple. But on the service side of things, how in the world do we hold these people accountable with fair KPIs? And, and that's I mean that's been a problem the entire time that I, I've been in existence as an agency is. How do we give these service-based folks a, a growth plan? How do we tell them, hey, when you achieve X on the KPIs, other than just cross-selling and yep. retention, which I don't know about you, but I don't like retention as a KPI for a service team member because it's intrinsically unfair, I think, because there are certain things that are completely outside the control of that service team member and penalizing them or withholding a raise or promotion from them because of retention, yep. which may or may not have anything to do with that person's performance. Uh, any thoughts you want to give there, just in a general sense of how we can make sense of compensation for the service side of the house? Because I think the sales side of the house is pretty straightforward on base comp, right? It is, it is. And uh, and the main thing too is, like when you ask about service, you actually, your point of our retention is very valid because when you kind of dive into the, the nerdy data around retention, there is a level of controllable retention and then there is a margin of non-controllable retention. Kind of same yeah. point. Businesses close, they they go out of business, they sell to another business and you don't have a foot in the door, right? There's a number of uncontrollable factors that may affect that number that ultimately you can't fully have an influence on. Um, I think there is some culpability as terms of like maintaining your workflows, maintaining certain timelines for communications and your renewal processes that severely impact retention. And so as an individual owner, say a comp plan, uh, a few examples that we would go through like Sometimes the comp is based on productivity, writing a certain number of policies or writing a certain number of revenue, et cetera. Um, but there are ways to design an incentive plan that has several metrics or several weighted factors, such as new business growth or maybe a retention factor or maybe some administrative goals like rolling out a new platform or a new resource. And then, you know, having certain KPIs to your point of, are we meeting our renewal timelines? Are we having other things that are falling through the cracks that would actually be a hindrance on the delivery of service or the delivery of sales to our clients? Those are things that if you're able to measure them, you can also manage them, which then you can have some type of incentive around them. It makes it a little bit more complicated. But again, if it's easily measurable, easily reportable, there are ways to have it as part of the conversation. Love it. 
Yeah, so there, there's a lot of meat on that bone for sure. And for you know, individual listeners out there that are in charge of figuring out compensation, uh, then what you just said is probably worth a, a little tapping the back button for 30 seconds and listening to again. And, you know, on the flip side, for those of you in listener land that are not an agency principal, that are on a team or you aspire to someday be an agency principal, you know, having these things in your pocket as you're negotiating for your next promotion, as you're having those conversations leading up to an annual review of, hey, in order for me to get my next promotion, my next raise, what do we need to do? And having the KPI conversation as, a, as an agency principal, if I have a team member come up to me and be like, hey, I want to raise, but I know I have to earn it. So here's what I'm thinking as far as earning my next raise. If somebody brings KPIs to me, yeah. well, well, that's refreshing. So, you know, as a team member, if you're looking for ways to improve your own compensation, you know, think about the, the KPIs, you know, read something in in the, the big eyes, um, you know, monthly magazine, independent or insurance agent magazine or insurance journal, you know, come to the table with ammunition in, in a conversa- compensation conversation. And, you know, that's not really the easiest thing to say three times <laughs> fast, right? Compensation conversation. Okay. Well, well, rather than just saying, I want more money. It's like, well, everybody wants more money, but here's what I'm going to do in order to get approval for that next raise or that next promotion. And Taking that proactive approach for the, the listeners out there that are not an agency principal, I think that is a really refreshing way to think about it. And it's data driven. It's really hard to argue with cold hard facts. And it's like the old the old negotiating tactic, if I can, would you be willing to dot dot sure. dot? And speaking from an agency professional, that's a really good way to approach the conversation. Well, the term there too, I think I learned when I was getting my MBA was managing up. And uh, one of my former yep. supervisors uh, changed my life whenever he introduced that concept to me. He's like, hey, like when I ask you to do certain responsibilities, and he just kind of dropped the hint. You know, if you actually took a little bit more initiative and did A and B, but also like kind of talked about C, that would actually take some things off of my plate and adds more value to what you're doing for our team. Yeah. And so when you're able to position yourself, just like you're saying, in that type of approach of adding that team value or adding the organizational value, that's when you can really have that intentional conversation around how can you be rewarded for that? Um, and even still, like, I'm not perfect at it. I'll just say that. But uh, that was actually part of the way that Carrie and I met. So I was, uh, when I got bored with the carrier, I mean, the agency side, I actually was like, you know what? I'll go work for a carrier for two years. So I went in the marketing department for a carrier, a uh, regional carrier here for a little while. And then after that, I realized how much I missed the agency space and the wonderful agents like you. And uh, I was like, I don't think I can go back to another close agency. Uh, I may want to go out on my own. And so I wrote out a business plan and actually had a couple things I wanted to do. Um, someone introduced me to Carrie's show and uh, saw that she had an opening. So I reached out and says, hey, I have a business plan. We might check it out for me. Give me some advice. And uh, she had an opening that was just posted. And uh, she offered to bring me on and, and support me as part of this process. And we'll work as a team to, to support each other and the services that we offer. And it's been, it's been wonderful. But part of my role as a consultant is, like Carrie's our founder, but uh, I also kind of a consultant producer, right? I'm in charge of producing my own business and managing up to my own KPIs and things that I'm trying to put in place. Uh, So this is also my first role, uh, advising producers, but also kind of having the responsibilities myself. So I'm Hmm. teaching teaching and learning at the same time, if that makes sense. When it comes to the role that you've chosen, the the path of, you know, insurance industry, a PNC industry consultant, I, you know, Carrie Wallace is as good as anyone you could be learning from or having for for a mentor on on the strategic planning and the financial side of things. You know, she she's fantastic. I I, I have nothing but the highest of regard for her. So um, you chose a good one. I I don't know how much research you did before that role, but well done. Yeah, I'll raise a glass to that for sure. Well, and some affirmation is I've not met one person that told me it was a bad idea so far. So uh, it's always yeah. been positive. And Carrie and I work well together in our team. We have Lauren and then Ali and uh, recently Lucia that have joined our team. Um, Love and it. we work very well together and, and hopefully provide a ton of value for agents and help them propel and grow. And, and kind of to your point, really just understand what KPIs are and then the action steps to make those move the needle to where it's valuable for them. So anything creative that you want to bring in is kind of like an oh, by the way sort of thing, you know, like like Steve Jobs used to do with his Apple keynotes. It was like one more thing before we move on to talk about the M&A stuff and valuations and what just give kind of a crash course on that side of things. 
Any creative nuggets in the compensation game, like non-monetary compensation or anything that you've seen agencies be really successful attracting good talent? Because one of our biggest challenges right now, we have available capital, we have money in the budget to bring people on, we just don't have the right people that we've mm -hmm. been able to attract. And we've had a lot of conversations. I mean, this week I've had two conversations from people that are in the industry. One person is not currently in an agency. They're actually uh, working as a, um, a BDR for a, an insure tech that's adjacent to the agency world. And then somebody else who's currently a, a producer at another shop elsewhere in the country that's looking at a remote position. Both of those people reached out to me and they just weren't a good fit for where we are right now as a company, specifically on the commercial side of things. Talent is the biggest problem we have, finding the right people to fill the next seat on the org chart. So, and I know that that is a huge problem with a lot of the people that listen to this podcast and really any insurance podcast, right? So anything that you can do, and even just for like a little tiny nugget of, hey, think about X the next time you're having a conversation with someone that you may want to attract or dare I say even poach. And I know we don't really talk about that in groups like yeah. IOA and soup and whatnot, but I promise you, if, if someone's not like in my close circle of peers, like if they're just another agency owner out there somewhere, I have no problem at all reaching out to someone on someone else's team and presenting them an opportunity they might find more attractive. Sure. Obviously there are certain lines that I'm never gonna cross, like if someone's in Killing Commercial, or if they're in a mastermind that I'm a group in, or if they're like in my circle of friends that I would consider like close peers, obviously everybody there is completely off limits. But there's a lot of folks out there whose name I know, but I wouldn't say that we're close, I wouldn't say that we're friends. And if I got the opportunity to go after one of their people somewhere else in the industry, I'm probably going to take a shot at that. Yeah. And, and that's not something that's ever really talked about because it's kind of taboo and nobody really wants to say out loud, yeah, if someone's in that third degree of friend circle, first and second degree of friend circle, totally off limits. But in that third degree, all right, let's have that conversation. What are some things that if we are going out and reaching out to someone and saying, you know, in the, in the when the compensation thing comes up, what do, what is there to do other than, well, here's your base salary, here's your split on new and renewal. We have benefits and four hundred one k and health insurance and car wash reimbursement or <laughs> company car or whatever all the usual stuff is. Anything outside of the box that you've seen people be successful with? Oh man, uh, I'm going to give you an answer that's not really, um, I guess, shiny. But you mentioned benefits. From a benchmarking standpoint and expense standpoint, we are actually seeing the cost of benefits increase just in general. Mm -hmm. And so in addition to compensation and pay, I think agency owners really need to pay attention to what are they spending on insurance? What are they spending on non-insurance benefits like employee meals or employee trips, that type of thing? Yeah. So it's, it's fairly standard. Again, it's not really shiny or anything new. Um, but in terms of, uh, you mentioned poaching. Uh, again, in, in bigger or regional or larger agency spaces, the term team lift out is actually a fairly common M&A term to where instead of buying the whole agency, they actually will just target a certain team that either writes a certain type of business or has a certain alignment with that agency's culture and is a better fit for them. Hmm. And so that actually would be the, the golden nugget. And again, it's not a new answer, but team culture and how you actually work together is going to make a huge difference. And so uh, I can tell you, um, I've worked with some producers in a national agency that it's actually better that they work for themselves. And they did. They left and started their own agency and there was no harm, no foul. You know, everybody's still cordial. Uh, but then there are others that if there was a team, another agency and that business model or the product that they sold didn't quite fit with what that agency was doing, they're actually happy to sell that to another agency that's willing to pick it up. And yeah. so it's, it's not just the compensation, but what is that agency doing? Is it a good alignment for you and your culture? And then, you know, is it also going to add value to what you're doing? Kind of like your conversation about having a footprint somewhere else or trying to pick up an auto owner's book, right? Yeah. Not just looking at the revenue, but what supports and what actually is part of that revenue. Um, and then from a compensation standpoint, actually just some advice for producers. Um, I'll throw this out there. Instead of asking what the commission split is, if the owner's transparent, I would actually ask, what is the average size of book of revenue for the producers in your office? Because that will actually give you more insight into either the support or the availability in the the systems available for that producer to succeed than somewhere else. Because if you see an average book of say 200,000 and those producers are happy, 
without growing, that's going to tell you a lot more than they see that their producers are average of three or four hundred thousand dollars and they're growing. Yeah. And so the number and the, the revenue available for them to have that potential to earn that compensation is not just about the commission split. It's about what's in that agency that allows them to exceed. Yep. No, and and for for Riskwell, I'm the only true producer in the entire office. Everybody else is basically an account executive because it's all inbound and it's referral based. We we do outbound, but I'm the only one in the office who does outbound. So if, if somebody comes to me and says, What's the average book size of the producers here? I'm like, Well It's you. <laughs> It's me. I'm the only yeah. real producer here. And yeah. my personal book, I have no idea because every every account we have is a house account yeah. because everybody here is paid on salary and they bonus when performance targets are hit. So I, I'm hearing you say that. I'm like, I should probably figure out what some of those numbers are because we're actively looking for uh, our first real outbound producer and we're very specialized. We're very focused in in five or six very clearly defined uh, niche verticals, and we don't stray outside of those. If if somebody doesn't fit one of those six categories, they're either going to go to our website and quote and bind a policy themselves, or they're not our insured. So you've given me some food for thought too, man, as far as how can we be more attractive to the people out there that may be inclined to, to listen to this podcast and think, yeah, I'd like to work at risk. Well, it seems like they're doing some cool stuff over there. Um, yeah. Th- thanks for that, man. I'm taking that one myself and going, I'm going to need to work on that. So uh, I'll leave very it, I'll a- leave excellent it. point. I'll, I'll tee one up for you. So I've heard you talk about how in many cases for the type of business you go after, you also would charge an agency fee and have say like a target revenue threshold for your accounts that you service. Yep. yep. And so that shows a lot about you as an owner, understanding the financials of your agency, understanding your ideal client profile and how you can actually deliver service to them. Charging a fee is actually not a bad thing if you do it intentionally and deliver on that value. So yeah. when I heard you say that in one of your shows, I was like, okay, this guy knows his agency. He's actually doing some really good stuff. And I, I got to be profitable. Like yeah. at the end of the day, I'm not running a charity. I sure. do this because I like money and I want more of it. And don't get me wrong. The why is super important. Because you got to get out of bed in the morning and be happy with how you spend your time, your effort, your energy. All of us do. Every member of my team, my wife and I, my wife started working back in the agency um, when our daughter went to pre-K four days a week back in August. So Allison, my wife, is is involved on a daily basis. And the why is very important to us. But at the end of the day, it don't matter what your why is if you're losing money every month. Yep. So it, profitability is something that is extremely important and it's probably a big deal for for why you have such a successful business and why you agency focus as a consulting firm has so much going on because so many of my peers in the retail side of insurance don't have any idea what they're doing from a financial literacy and strategic planning perspective if i had to guess i'd say most of the conversations that you have with agency owners and and key leaders is probably somewhere in one of those two buckets right Financial literacy and strategic planning. It is. And actually, that's a good transfer way or transfer into the next part of the conversation about M&A is the two factors that really lead to an agency's value is profitability and then the risk profile of that agency. And so what's the reasonable cash flow that's available to a potential owner or buyer or seller? And how protected is that cash flow over a period of time that an owner is willing to assume as an investment? And so if your agency is running very clean financials and you're only putting expenses that are relative to the agency, you're investing in things that are driving service that you're actually delivering to your clients, that's going to add more value than in many cases, agency owners that are leasing cars or having tons of locations that aren't really profitable. Because at the end of the day, when another owner takes over, the actual cash in the business is going to make a big difference as to how they can afford that agency. Yep. And those lifestyle agents out there that are running every possible expense through their agency and using it to fund their golfing trips, you know, those folks don't realize how much value they're stealing from themselves. Because when you go to sell, it doesn't look very good on paper because your EBITDA is, who knows what your EBITDA is. It's probably 50% less, 75% less, maybe even half 
of what it could be if you cleaned up things and had everything categorized properly and ran your actual expenses through your agency instead of a whole bunch of quasi personal expenses so you can save on taxes. So that is actually that's a good point because oftentimes we'll do evaluation and during our review sessions or and follow up questions, the owner will say, Well, why does my CPA tell me that I need to run this to the agency to save on taxes if you're telling me that it's not a good thing? It's like, well, because well, the MA consultant and the CPA have completely contradictory priorities. Well, it's not necessarily that. It's really, do you want to save on taxes now and save a little bit of cash in your pocket? Or are you willing to invest in a longer horizon and have a payout at a different date? That's a better way to say it. You're right. I was a little bit too gen, you know, generalized in my comment there, for sure. So, as, I, mean, as, I mean, a good example is like looking at the difference between a Roth IRA or traditional IRA. It's not necessarily that one is worse or better than the other. It's is it a vehicle that is going to accomplish the investment and retirement goals that you have? Yeah, you're right. So when, when we when we pivot to valuation, when we pivot to M and A, there's there's obviously there's two sides of this. You know, there's the buy side and the sell side. The vast majority of the people listening to this podcast are on the buy side or mm -hmm. aspiring to be on the buy side. Most of the people that listen to this podcast are nowhere near their sunset. You know, they have decades left, lots of years left um, before they, they want to exit. So um, I might be disappointing some people uh, when saying, hey, take the sell side of this equation and how to maximize your value uh, for, for an exit. Uh, let's save that one for a different day because I, I don't think that particular topic is you know super relevant for my audience. And if I'm wrong, feel free to hit me up in the comment section or or uh, you know drop me a message on LinkedIn and say, hey, I want to have a sell side conversation. Uh, you know, I, I'm looking at other opportunities or looking to do a roll up with a bigger agency or you know regional or whatever. Um, but let's talk about this on the buy side. When we are getting ready to enter into, you know, a particular effort for acquiring other agencies, other books, other teams, acquiring something, what are some of the, the, the key things that you would want an agency to be doing before they enter into that, that switch mentally of, I am looking for stuff to buy? What, what should they do before? Oh, wow. Uh, before anything, you should know your own agency. And so yep. knowing the makeup of your book of business, your ideal client, your average client, how your staffing is put together, knowing your own agency will put you in a better position to make a more intentional decision for purchasing another book of business. Because kind of back to the other point we had about culture and trying to find new teams, that's the other side of that, that equation is if you don't know yourself, bringing in another uh, situation that you're trying to manage or get your arms around and then could unsurface some other conflict that you have. So again, if their markets aren't aligned or if the ideal clients that are there in their agency don't line up with yours, now you have to change your service model. And so knowing who you are first puts you in a better position to really make a more informed decision to bring that into your, your own kind of space. Hmm. No, I love that, man. So w when someone gets an opportunity or, or they, you know, they reach out to someone on LinkedIn or in their network and they do the little fishing thing of, hey, I'm just reaching out to folks and seeing where everyone's at as far as sentiments and what you may be looking to do in the next six to 12 months. And they do the little fishing expedition. And someone says, hmm, yeah, let's have that conversation. What in, in, in your mind is the best way to figure things out? It, the, the buy box, everybody has a different buy box, of course. You know, the, the go, no go. When you are helping people evaluate M&A, like may, what's one or two things that are absolutely non-negotiable? Either on the go or the no go side, it's like, if I see X, I know it's game on. And if I see Y, I know it's like slam the brakes, baby. No, get out, back away, stage five, clinger, evacuate. You know, one of those kind of situations. Take the question either way you want to, either go or no go, or both even if you want to get frisky. Sure. Uh, let's start with go. Probably, and to your earlier point too about like your AEs and, and knowing your own uh, staffing is asking the other owner, hey, tell me about your staff. What do they like? Tell me about like, do they like family stuff? Like 
you know, they do stuff in their free time. Like, tell me about your staff. Who are they as people? Because oftentimes what is going to make their break, the success of that transfer book of business is the people that support that book of business. Because yep. if you just buy it and try to roll it into your codes, that's going to be a totally different ball game than you're actually trying to integrate an entire team into your own team structure. And so really knowing that other team, how they function, what motivates them, who they are as people, also their relationship with that owner. Uh, something we look at in evaluation is we get a roster of the current staffing, but then we also ask them, hey, tell me about the people that have left your agency in the last 12 to 24 months. So that we see or have some indication of, is there a high turnover there? Or are people having issues with certain parts of the agency that either could be an opportunity for a new owner to either address or add value, or it might be something that they have to assume that they might not be willing to assume. Hmm. No, that, that's great. The, the people really are the X factor, right? The, the book yeah. of business is, obviously it's important, but the relationships that are attached to that book of business, I feel like are probably way more important in the grand scheme of things. So the other than the people on that team, is there anything else that really comes to mind as far as a go or no go? It's like strong opinions on yes or no. Uh, I think probably having a game plan of what you would do before you get into negotiations so that you know where you stand and what your, your go no go is. And then really understanding the intentions and the goals of the other owner to see if there is alignment. The negotiations, oftentimes, you know, people kind of jump to the dollar figure. But when you ask an agency owner, what do you value the most? Usually it's their employees, their clients, and then third or fourth on the list is oftentimes the selling price of the agency. Yeah. And so knowing what's important to that other owner and whether or not you can fulfill those needs or those goals can actually add some value to not just giving them a check or, you know, taking out a loan to transfer that book of business. And uh, if there are other things that are personal to them or, or things that would be, you know, something that they really cherish, being aware of those things and make sure that you can either either align with them or it's a breaker for you to, to kind of see in the picture before you you hit that checkbox, as you say. Yeah, I mean, I, I can say for, for personal experience, I'm entirely open to a roll up if the right opportunity came along and I was able to maintain uh, an executive function and obviously still have input in my team. I have no interest in ever leaving the game, but if the right opportunity comes along and I get to keep playing the game, but just level up in some capacity, whether it's through some collaboration with SIAA, my current network, or or something else that comes along in the future that I'm not currently aware of, you know that commitment that I made to my team, because there's several people here that have indicated they intend to be here, you know, indefinitely. They have no intentions of ever leaving. And that is so personal. Yeah. That is such an important piece of the puzzle for me that whether it's five years from now or 20 years from now, whatever my team looks like at the time, that's a very high priority for me because I'm good. I'm going to be just fine. Whatever we do, whatever the exit, at whatever time it is, you know, years down the road, I know I'm going to be fine. But I got to make sure that my team, the people that have committed their careers and their hours and effort to be on mission with us, like that's certainly the most important thing to me. So it makes perfect sense that, you know, you're, you're saying that that's basically what everybody typically does or, or at least should be. Unless, you know, you're some cold hearted sociopath, you're just looking out for yourself <laughs> and, you know, in that case, can I have your roster of your team with their phone and email, please? Because I'd like to call each one of them. Which and, those uh, <laughs> owners, they do exist. They are out there. But uh, but I'll tell you that level of intentionality of understanding the team and culture exists at all levels of agency, no matter the size. Because even some of the larger deals that happen, uh, like even some of the ones that I was involved in. So $125 million agency sold to a $325 million agency and merged together to form almost $500 million. Hmm. They, they will say that the agency that we merged with was not the highest bidder. But the culture aligned the leadership teams aligned and there was other things that were more important to the organizations than just the dollar figure. There's even another local agency here in my hometown that was one of the largest kind of regional family owned agencies in the area and had a long standing family reputation. They recently just sold to a national and there was a lot of conversation. A lot of people, you know, either had mixed feelings and the owner would say that, you know, they weren't the highest bidder, 
but the value that they brought to the conversation with us about valuing our people, valuing our community, valuing the things that we feel are important, they said they would uphold and try to deliver. And mm. that was what helped make the decision. Man, I, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that because I have zero plans to do that anytime soon. I just know that if the right opportunity came along to do something like that and the right culture, the right people, and the right why behind it, I, I would entertain the opportunity. But I've seen so many people in our circle, you know, even going as far back as Zach Gould and Matt Namoli at, at GNN, who sold to the Hilb Group a few years ago. Uh, and, and they took executive positions within the Hilb Group. It's like seeing them go through that and hearing their stories, and they've been previous guests on this podcast that told their story about, you know, choosing to exit and choosing to participate in a roll up and, and do that. Just hearing their why. Yeah. And they echoed literally everything that you just said. And I, I give them a lot of credibility, uh, excuse me, credit for helping me get to where I am because I was listening to their podcast, Bobble On. Uh, you can't find it anymore. All the episodes were taken down, unfortunately. It breaks my heart that I don't have an archive of that because, wow, what a great podcast. Uh, but it, their story is the same story that so many good principles have or expect and want to have in the future. So everything that you're saying is, is ringing true in my own recollections of all these other stories of people that have gone through exactly what you're describing. So, man, I really yeah, appreciate uh, you sharing your perspective there. Any, any final thoughts before we look to close this thing up? Sure. I'll kind of add to that just one more step, and I'll kind of call you out on something you said earlier. So, not Come really, on. I love it. Not, call me not out, really, baby. Not really focusing on your exit as being the top relevant thing for your audience. Yeah. One thing that we try to really have in our services and our conversations with owners is really understanding your exit plan will help you be set up and prepared for when that opportunity does come. So the term is usually prepare like you're going to sell tomorrow, but the value of the agency will be drastically different based on who you plan to sell to in the future. Yeah. And so whether that's private and internal transactions to another employee or say a family member versus selling to a PE firm or selling to a national public broker, those are different positionings that you need to be in. And so you need to kind of see your end goal and what you want your end goal to be so that you are taking steps so that when that opportunity does come around, you're ready to, to kind of hit that checkbox. Um, that doesn't say that you have to run your ship like a hub or like you said, a hill group or whatever, but knowing what those models are and how you can get your agency to be positioned to be that attractive candidate is what's yep. going to set you apart when that time comes. Yep. You're right. Where was the call out there? I thought I was going to get attacked for something. Oh, no. No, no uh, I agree with everything you just said. Sure. Um, but like, and I'll just call it out too. People talk about multiples of revenue as a way to value agencies. People say 2X, yeah. 3X. You hear stories now of 5 or 6X of revenue in some cases, but in those... <laughs> Wait, hold on a second. Where are you here in 5 and 6? I mean, anything north of 3 or 3.5 is just like, what? So, so from a, 5 and 6 are out there somewhere? Even as an M&A analyst, I'll tell you those numbers blow my brain. So... Um, from a cash flow standpoint, it doesn't make sense, but oftentimes you'll hear stories, I'll quote, hear stories of owners selling for 5X. Wow. But what you often don't hear is there's a guarantee in the beginning. So a check that is cut in the front end. But and there's then the, an earnout that's very squishy, right? Yes. Very squishy or very, very rigid. As in they have to hit X amount of growth rate and the leadership has to stay for three to five years, right? So it's it's usually a three to five year case to actually get that additional payout over that period of time hitting very specific performance metrics. Mm. And so um, I guess the, the moral of that story is if you want to sell for a big number or sell for an optimal number, you kind of have to understand what the, the rules of that game are so yeah. that you can be prepared to to play ball whenever you get your chance to step on the court. And that's, that's really hard for me because I enjoy this game so much. It is so much fun. Yeah. If I ever choose to not do this, I'm gone like Shark Tank. I am out. <laughs> yep. I'm out. Bye. It's like the day that I don't do this anymore, I don't do this anymore. And I'm doing something totally different. The idea of a long earnout where I'm flying somebody else's flag for multiple years I have a hard time seeing that. So yeah. it's, yeah, it, I know that that's normal. I just know that for me, the exit would probably not look like that. It would, 
If I had to guess, it's probably an, an internal acquisition at some point a long time from now. Uh, if I was going to play, you know, Nostradamus over here. But, I mean, you, you make excellent points, Colby. And I, I think overall, this, this has been a very informative conversation, not just for the audience, but for me personally. I, I'm, I'm taking notes left and right here. So uh, I definitely want to have another conversation with you a few months from now on the things we left unsaid. So if, if there's anything you want to end with as we land the plane, any final thoughts? And then I'd love for you to tell people where they can find you if they want to have an introductory conversation about potentially hiring you and Agency Focus. Uh, to work on a project for them or consult for M&A activity. Uh, feel free to, to wrap up with final thoughts and then give us the pitch, man. No, sure. Uh, first thing is kudos to all the agency owners that are out there. Um, every owner that we ever meet, they're fantastic salespeople. They're fantastic leaders in a lot of cases. Um, and then the reason that they would engage with somebody like us is to really have a, a more snapshot picture of those aspects of the business that they may not be seeing closely. And so... One of the other pieces of advice that I always got in my professional career was, you know, if you're not a professional or something, like, don't be afraid to hire people that are smarter than you to do it. I'm not saying I'm smarter. What I'm saying is uh, the attention and the service that we deliver is on the aspects of agencies that oftentimes the owner, their, your time is valuable producing. Your time is valuable working on the agency to grow it. And so if we can step in to help put the financial picture to accomplish your goals a little bit easier for you, that's our goal. Um, so yeah, we help with producer compensation planning. We help with valuations for agencies, fractional CFO engagements. Uh, if you have growth goals or need to have some, you know, again, some organization of your financials to make sure that you're seeing them on a regular basis and you're actually getting the information you need. And then we do a number of other just, um, kind of relative consulting services around financial aspects. So we'll do like productivity studies. Um, we'll actually dive into some, uh, compensation studies for agencies regionally, a couple of things like that. So. Uh, but to find me, I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I comment a lot. Don't post as much as I probably should, but I comment a lot uh, on things. So you can either connect with me there, uh, send me a message. Uh, my email is colby at agency-focus.com. Feel free to shoot me an email if you ever want to chat about anything. Um, we actually offer a free 30-minute consult for anybody uh, to either engage with other services or try to figure out some advice for their agency. Um, so feel free to grab any time that's free on my calendar, and I'll be willing to, happy to sit down and have a chat. We'll put this information in the show notes, folks. So, Colby, give us that URL uh, for the, the consult scheduling. Is it just agency-focus.com? Yeah, so if you go to agency-focus.com, you'll see our services, and there's a contact us page that you'll have access to my calendar, to Carrie's calendar, and then uh, you'll see our team listing there. So you can schedule with me or Carrie, um, agency-focus.com, and then find our, our contact page. This has been a fantastic conversation, man. Very tactical, and I love that. So yeah, he is uh, Colby Allen. He is a, an advisor and a consultant with Agency Focus. And this has been another episode of the Agency Freedom Podcast. Make it a great day, boys and girls. We'll talk to you again real soon. Y'all take care.